always a blessing to us to assist us in our worship. If you have your Bibles, it's been a while since we've been in Ephesians 3. Turn to verse 16. And kind of like the book of Ephesians is split in half, this sermon is going to be split in half. The first part is going to be encouraging. The second part is going to be convicting. So lace up. We've been some time since we've been here and we have learned a lot of deep, important truth in Paul's epistle to the Ephesians. We think about how much we've learned about what it means to be in Christ. There's a lot under that heading. And then we've also learned a lot about how truly rich we are in Christ as a result of being in Christ. And then we've also learned about the church. We've learned about the true church in the world, the body of Christ, and all of the resources that God's people have as a result of being adopted by grace family members in the family of God. And it's really something to think about the fact that for all Christians in the world today, life, both in time and in eternity, has such a profound depth of true meaning and purpose and fulfillment, while the rest of humanity does everything under the sun to find those things, but they never, ever get there. No matter how much money or power or fame they may accumulate, in this earthly life, they never, ever reach that sense of true meaning and purpose in life. They're always grasping for it, trying different things. Because true meaning and purpose and fulfillment are only found by those who are under the umbrella of of sovereign grace through salvation in Christ. I told you last time, if for just a moment we could really grasp how truly rich we are, spiritually speaking, with our spiritual riches, we would never for one moment Consider trading places with any lost billionaire ever. It wouldn't even be a thought that you would want to trade with them if you could fully grasp your spiritual riches. Their earthly riches come to an end one day for all of them. And even what they have, again, is, is no cons comparison to being, as we learned in Ephesians 1, blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Our lives are, are really so very different from, from so many people out there who are desperately seeking meaning in their life. A character in one of Arthur Miller's plays, once said this to her husband. Life is deteriorated to how many miles we get on our Volkswagen. Think about that. That's the position of a lot of lost people. How sad for a couple to get near the end of their married life and one of the big issues that they deal with is how long will the last car last? 
so we don't have to buy another one. That's sad. It's so true. So many people. We saw a lot of them out there yesterday at the Fall Fest. What are they doing? They're plodding through life, watching TV, eating breakfast, lunch, and supper, and doing whatever else it is during their day, whether they're working, whether they're retired, or whatever their their earthly things they are that they do day after day after day after day until that final morning. That final morning is coming for everybody. I told you, it doesn't matter whether you die at morning, noon, or midnight. There's one final morning for every human being. And you're one day closer to it today than you were yesterday. And so am I. And what must it be like? If you have no true meaning and purpose in your life, to get to that final morning and think, what was it really all for? But I'm here to tell you for Christians, it's not like that for us at all. And I think that the focus of that reality becomes most clear for all Christians on Sunday. On Sunday, we're all here. We are here in this beautiful building that God has graced us with for a few hours. And while we are here, in the time period that we are here, we are totally set apart right now from the outside world full of people who have no true meaning or purpose in their life. And whatever purpose they do have, whether it's through hobbies or their jobs or their family, those purpose and meaning that they think they have are only man-centered and they're fleeting and they are never, ever totally satisfying, ever. I can tell you that for sure. But because before I came to Christ, the things I thought had purpose were fleeting. And they didn't give total satisfaction. And they never scratched the itch that is inside of every human being. Which as Tim said this morning, is the God-shaped vacuum in in the heart of every person. And only He can fill it, as you've heard many times. But for all of us who have surrendered to King Jesus and saving faith, you need to understand how rich you are. We all have the divine resources of Almighty God at our disposal every single moment of every single day. We are all a part of the infinite, eternal God's amazing plan. This this miracle called the church. God's people. And in the wisdom and kindness of God, He has designed for us to meet together for worship, and fellowship, and discipleship on His special day, once a week, every week of the year. 52 Sundays a year, year in and year out. And we love this day. We love this time. As I often say, what a, what a mercy. And what a grace it is. If you desire in your heart of hearts to come to this spiritual oasis, which is unlike any other time out there, anywhere, during your week, and what a mercy and a grace if you come as a Christian with joy 
and thanksgiving and expecting to hear from the word of God through the word preach as we as we grow together in the faith once delivered to the saints. And as we're here, we're doing it right now. I want you to think about the fact that literally right now, tens of thousands of people just in Central, just in this Central community of our fellow citizens slept in. And right now and the rest of this day will do nothing of eternal value whatsoever. Dreading, most of them, Monday. I gotta go back to work. It's the cycle. Eat, get up, eat, work, come home, watch TV, go to bed, wake up, rinse, repeat, recycle, no meaning, no purpose. And let me make another. Sunday contrast for you. Viktor Frankl is an author who survived terrible trials in a concentration camp. And he wrote a book called The Doctor and the Soul. And he's not a Christian. But he made some interesting observations about Sundays. And I want you to hear them by way of contrast. And this is really a generalization that applies to all unbelievers on Sunday. Listen as he writes. In any city, Sunday is the saddest day of the week. It is on Sunday that the tempo of the working week is suspended. And the poverty of the meaning of everyday life is exposed. Let that sit on you for a minute. The emphasis of a fast tempo in the personal life is reminiscent of the clinical picture of unproductive mania. That's quite a phrase. He goes on. The yield of all the to-do speaking of Sunday, is zero. We get the impression that these people who know no goal in life are running the course at the highest possible speed so that they will not notice the aimlessness of it. They are at the same time trying to run away from themselves, but in vain. On Sunday... When the frantic pace passes for 24 hours, all the aimlessness and meaninglessness and emptiness of their existence rises up before them once more. That's for every unbeliever right now in the community and in our world. It's extremely interesting to me, that this unbeliever would observe the focus of meaninglessness that becomes apparent, most apparent, on Sundays for unbelievers. They don't have no job to go to. Now, put this together. A fallen world with no meaning becomes most manifest to them on the same exact day that the believing world gathers and withdraws from the fallen world to be together to celebrate the spiritual resources of meaning and purpose and fulfillment that are found in Christ. Those two things happen at the same time every Sunday. Most manifest. It's incredible to think about. 
What an extreme privilege is ours, folks, to be a part of the redeemed world through Christ with meaning, with purpose. The people who matter most to God are His children and His family. And that's not because of anything in us. That's not because we're so special. That's because He's so special. And what He has done in our lives by grace alone. We are the people who have a part in His plan that end up in the most positive, glorious part of the plan at the end. And we're on our way to the fulfillment of the plan. Right now, it is beyond the full stretching of our minds to consider. Why did God choose me? I can't answer that. I can't answer that for me. I can't answer that for you. The only answer I can give you is what his word says according to the kind intention of His will, by His grace, for His glory. There was nothing that we had to offer Him but our sin and our rebellion, just like everybody else. Let that sit on you today as you sit in His house for church. John MacArthur says one of the three great tasks of the Apostle Paul in the first three chapters of Ephesians is to present this great truth that God has chiseled us out of the rock of meaninglessness, that God is making us into the image of Christ and he has poured upon us the pure gold of his blessing. That's who we are. Now, I don't have time for a big review, but you may remember the illustration of the car for Ephesians. I hope you do. The engine is the first three chapters. The roadmap for the Christian life is chapters four to six. And the ignition switch is Paul's prayer here in verses 14 to 21. So really what I need to do, let's just read the whole prayer again as we get started back to where we left off in Ephesians 3, starting in verse 14. Remember, this is Paul's prayer. For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner man so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith and that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints, what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ, which surpasses knowledge that you may be filled up to all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do far more abundant beyond all that we ask or think, according to the power that works within us. To him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. What a prayer that is. And as I said, in this prayer, to one truth building upon another. And there were five truths in this prayer. Inner strength, indwelling Christ, incomprehensible love, infinite fullness, and internal power. Now, if those things don't get your engine turned on, I have no idea what to tell you as a Christian. 
Now, we've already looked at inner strength in verse 16. Look at that verse again. That he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner man. And we talked all about already the indwelling Holy Spirit. We have this incredible power resource within us. And we made, remember that contrast between the outer man and the inner man and how much time we spend on the outer man when we really need to be considering and spending much more time on the inner man. And that's why Paul was praying for the strengthening with power through the spirit of the inner man. And if you didn't hear that message or messages, go back online and listen. And you remember, remember this, to have, to have a strong inner man is the same as saying you have a spirit-controlled life. And what was the key to that? The key to that is to fill your mind with the Word of God. The only way you're going to yield to the Spirit of God at the moment of decision each and every day, whether to walk in the flesh or walk in in the spirit is if there's more Bible in there than there is man-centered things. That, remember, is what enables us to yield to the spirit at the moment of decision. And remember, every single Christian, every single moment of every single day has the ability and the option to either walk in the spirit or walk in the flesh. Now let's go to the second one. The indwelling Christ. When there is a strong inner man, there is a result. After, after praying Paul to, to be strengthened with power through his spirit, the inner man, look in verse 17 next. Next phrase, so that, or you could say, in order that, meaning a purpose or a result, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, or you could say, with the purpose that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And this is the second point, the indwelling Christ. We talked a little bit about it last time. Now, you may have never thought of it this way before. You, you might be thinking, well, how could we have the Holy Spirit and not have Christ in you, the hope of glory? Or you might be thinking, well, wait, first you have Christ, and, and then in sanctification you're strengthened by the Spirit in the inner man. I mean, we just went through almost three chapters. We're one with Christ. We're one in Him. We are in Him. He is in us over and over. But what you have to understand right here in this verse, first of all, is that this is not referring to getting saved. He's not, he's not saying this. Now that you're strengthened with power through the Holy Spirit, the result is going to be Christ is going to come into your life. No. So, so what is he saying? This is where we got to focus in on the Greek. Look at that word in verse 17. Dwell. See that? That word in the Greek has a very, very important meaning. It means to be at home or to dwell at home. Very, very literally, it means this, to settle down and be at home. So what Paul is saying here is when you really have that inner strength and you're really walking in the spirit and your spirit control, what is going to happen is that Christ is going to be really settled down at home in your heart. That's what he's trying to convey. Now, we're moving from encouragement. Do you think there are times in the lives of all Christians where Christ dwells, but he's not all that comfortable at times? Hmm? It's a very convicting thought, isn't it? In this fierce battle 
that we have with our own flesh, as we talked about before last time, grieving the spirit, when we grieve the spirit, when we quench the spirit, anytime we fail spiritually, wouldn't it be right to consider how at those moments we make Jesus uncomfortable? Hmm? Not settled down and at home in our hearts? So, so what Paul is getting at is very convicting. We can be saved, justified. Christ is in our life. But when the Spirit is not in control, Christ is not comfortable there. He's not at home, settled down. In fact, He's always having to clean up the place. All of us know what it's like to come home. We've had a busy week and the house is a mess. Total wreck. Now, the house doesn't exist that way at my house for very long because I'm married to Christy Gay. And I'm very thankful for that. She likes to keep keep a clean house. And she will put anybody to work. If you happen to be there at the moment of the need of cleaning, you will pick up something and help. But you know how it is. Once you clean the house up and you get it all straightened up, that's when you can sit down, right? And relax. Everything is straight, clean, and that's when you can just settle down and be at home, have a conversation or whatever. Now, connect that thought to Jesus and his dealing with you and his dealing with me. He's in your life, but the work is not always done in the house. He can't just settle down and commune with you because he's got to be up and about cleaning things because everything is not all right in your house, in your heart. And that's the question we have to be asking ourselves as we grow in the Christian faith. If you are assured of your faith, the question is not, Is Jesus there? That's not the question. The question is, is he comfortable there? That's the issue here. In fact, the further we are away from being yielded to the Spirit of God, the more uncomfortable he is. And when he is uncomfortable, church, let me tell you something. His cleaning process is not comfortable for us. It's called chastening. He chastens those whom he loves. You ever been on the receiving end of that, Christian? If you're a Christian, you say, no, you might be fixing to get some because you just lied in your mind in church. You've come to Christ on his terms of repentance and faith, and you have been born again, you have been regenerated, you have peace with God, you have a relationship with God through faith alone and the person and work of Christ, there is nothing that is going to change that relationship. Nothing. In position, you are justified in the sight of God. You have been imputed with the righteousness of Christ Your eternal inheritance is absolutely 100% guaranteed. But during your time, during this life on this mortal coil, that does not necessarily mean that at all times, Jesus is going to be comfortable living in your life. Would you agree with that? God has ordained this struggle with our flesh for our good and for our growth. Now, that statement does not excuse our sin. Listen carefully. It does not make light 
of our sin, but it does acknowledge the reality of our struggle with our sin, right? In the flesh. But as I've asked you many times, and I'll probably ask you many more times again before I die, Christian, when are the times in your life when you feel the best? When you're on the top of the mountain? If you're a genuine believer, there's only one answer. When I'm walking in the Spirit. That's when you're on top of the mountain, right? And it's only at those times when you are strengthened by His Spirit in the inner man, as Paul is praying for us to be here, that Jesus is truly comfortable. It's only at those times that Jesus is truly settled down and at home in your heart. Now, isn't that what you want? Well, I got news for you. You don't work at this daily. You don't work at it hourly. You got to work at this moment by moment. A living pattern. Moment by moment that you have to be diligent and focused on literally for the rest of your life on earth. I hate to tell you. Now, if you're not convicted enough yet, let me give you some excerpts from a little booklet entitled, My Heart, Christ's Home. It's an allegory where a person's heart and life is like a house. And Jesus comes to your house, your heart, and he starts to check it out. The fact that he's there indicates that the person is a Christian in the first place. First, he goes to the library. That's the control room of the house. It's like the brain. What you read, your books. Nowadays, the book is little booklets old, but what you read on your phone, look at computer. It's where the, all the information is stored. And Jesus goes into that room, which is the mind. And boy, he finds all manner of things in there. Many of the things are not good. Bad things. Bad thinking. He finds useless things. He finds very man-centered things, materialistic things that won't help you at all, neutral things that have no eternal value. And Jesus just takes all that off the shelf in your library, he throws it all away, and he puts the, the Word up there. His Word. That's the library. The control room. And then he goes to the dining room. The dining room is the room of appetites, the desires. What do you really feast on? What do you really hunger for? And he finds a very worldly menu. He finds a, a menu that again includes materialism and the praise of man the desire of the praise of man, the need for prestige and acknowledgement from other people and accolades. He finds the, all the manner of the lust of the flesh and he takes it all out, puts a new menu in, the food that truly satisfies the, the will of God. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And then Jesus goes to the living room. Because the, the living room is where you share your fellowship. He goes in there. He gets in there and he finds that's where he's neglected. A lot of activity going on in the living room. But nobody's paying attention to him. He's just kind of there. A lot of activity happening, but he's just there, with nobody paying attention to him. 
Think of it this way. Imagine your very best friend in the whole world and you spend a whole day with them. The entire day, starting at breakfast. And, and they are at your side the whole time, being nice, wanting to give you some suggestions like maybe we could go here or maybe we could do this. But all day long, you never even bother to acknowledge the presence of your friend. You never even say hello. You, you just go about your business like, like they are not even there. How long do you think your friend would be your friend after that day like that? Not long, right? Well, Jesus is the same kind of friend, only in a greater way. And it's very likely for me too that not long ago he spent an entire day with you through which you never acknowledged his presence one time the whole day. Not once. Never one time. And yet he is the very best friend you ever had forever. Sure is a good thing it's based on him and not on us, right? So the living room is the place of fellowship, but it's important for you to have the right fellowship. This is also where you spend time with Christ, and it's also where you spend time with other people who have Christ living in them. That's what church is. Is all about forsake not the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is, as much the more as you see the day approaching. This is this is necessary for us to provoke each other to love and good works. And that's not just on Sundays. Every single Wednesday night we eat a meal right over there at those tables. And then we come over here and we pray together and we get to know one another better. If you haven't been in a while, come check us out and eat with us. Fellowship, spend time with Jesus, spend time with the people that Jesus lives in. It's very important in the life of every Christian. Well, then Jesus goes to the workshop. And in the workshop, he finds all these fantastic tools and a magnificent workbench. And the guy in there, he's just making toys. That's it. And Jesus says, man, you got all this ability and all this great equipment. And you can't produce anything more than a toy. And he says that because he really wants to take all of your gifts and abilities and all of the resources that he has given you spiritually and get you to use them to, to produce things for the advancement of his kingdom, things that will lay up treasure in heaven for you, things that have eternal value. So he changes the whole format of the workshop. And then in the little booklet, after he's got the library straight, dining room, living room, with the fellowship, the workshop is ready and all the tools are ready to be used in the right way, suddenly a strange odor starts coming from somewhere in the house. The house is clean, but something stinks. It smells like something died, like a dead rat behind the icebox. And Jesus knows something isn't right. And the guy says, look, you've cleaned everything up in here. But I mean, I just need you to leave one closet for me. I mean, you can have all these other rooms. Just, th th this one over here is my closet. And Jesus says, no. I want that closet too. Because in that closet is all the hidden personal sins where only God sees. And the man got angry because after all, well, Jesus, you got every other room. Jesus says, nope. Open that door too. And when he does, it's full of all those secret things. Nobody else knows about things and thoughts and deeds that nobody else is aware about but you and God. 
And Jesus takes and cleans all that too. And it, boy, does it take some scrubbing for him to clean that out. And then finally, when he's got it all done, he finds himself settled and at home. And that's what Paul means here in verse 17 when he says, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts. Settle down. Be at home. Lotus through faith. And that last phrase is the key. How do we know that he's in our home? Through faith. By faith we believe. We live by faith and not by sight. Go back to the start. How do you know that Jesus is in the heart of your home of your heart? Because I believe it by faith and faith alone. And I feel it and I experience it in real time when Jesus is cleaning the house. Huh? And I live my life knowing that in position all my sins are forgiven because of the faith alone in Christ. But at the same time, during this life, I'm confessing and acknowledging my sins and my struggles and the daily battle I have with my flesh. And I'm striving every day to live my life for his glory. And I want him in there cleaning and and pruning until the day when the house will be clean in a way that I can't even imagine right now. And that's after I'm dead. And what a thought it is to consider that the incomprehensible king of the universe would condescend to even want to calm down and settle and be at home in my heart. And yet he does in the heart of every believer. This is what he said in his answer to Judas, not Iscariot, in John 14, verse 23. Jesus answered and said to him, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him and we will come to him and make our abode with him. That is an unbelievable statement by Jesus. God the Father, God the Son, settling down and being at home, an abode with us, it's utterly amazing, totally convicting. Never forget, as Dr. Sproul has taught us, we live every moment of every day, quorum Deo. That's Latin for in the presence of God every second. Paul is praying for the inner man to be strengthened because you can't deal with that house cleaning unless it's in the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, I need to move on to number three. I mean, because we could stay in that lane for a while. The result of inner strength, Christ dwells in your hearts by faith. And then look next in verse 17. We're going to wrap up with this one. There's another purpose, and result clause. Look next. And that you, or you could say, in order that, or you could say, with the purpose that, you being rooted and grounded in love. Now stop there. Everybody wants love, right? Huh? Everybody wants to know love and experience love. And here's the key. A strong inner man leads to Christ being at home which leads to our being rooted and grounded in love. That's why I told you, one thing builds upon another. But as a Christian, you will never get to know this kind of love until you've gone through those first two steps. Inner strength leads to the indwelling Christ, which leads to incomprehensible love. Now, let's talk about love. People are confused about what love is. Very confused, especially in America. Agape love. Real Biblical, genuine, sacrificial love. Think back to the allegory of the little book we went over. If Christ is at home in you and he controls the library, the thinking, the dining room, the appetites, the living room, the fellowships, he controls the workshop, the talents and gifts and what you're doing, and he's in there and he's scrubbing that closet out, then it's his nature that takes up dominance in you And what is his nature, most of all? Love. I'm not saying this is easy. You better get me on that. I'm not saying this is easy. 
This is us and him working together. We've got to go back always to Philippians 2, middle of verse 12, and then verse 13. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. That's us. For it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. And when you become rooted and grounded in love, that's when you're able to experience verses 18 and 19 that you may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge that you may be filled up to all the fullness of God. God, that is Paul's magnificent prayer for us. That's why it was put down in scripture for all of church history. And he's not even done yet. We still got two more verses to go after this. We ain't even looked at them yet. But where we are in this prayer at this point is, Christian, that you would know the love of Christ. Jesus said, the new commandment I give you that you love one another as I have loved you that you love one another. The very first fruit of the spirit is what? Love. 1 Peter 1.22, since you have in obedience to the truth purified your souls for a sincere love of the brethren, fervently love one another from the heart. 1 Peter 4.8, above all, keep fervent in your love for one another because love covers a multitude of sins. True love, real love, is not Hollywood love. That's not love. Love is an attitude of selflessness. Unselfish sacrifice. Love is service. The world wants to emphasize emotion with love. But true love is an act of selflessness. That's the only thing. Keep a marriage together is selflessness. I'm not talking about emotion. God so loved the world that he felt emotional about it. Is that what John 3.16 says? No, he gave. His only begotten son to be a sacrificial, atoning, substitutionary sacrifice for sinners. That's love. Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandment. If any man loves me, he will keep my words. First John, if you don't meet your brother's need, how dwells the love of God in you? Love is not an emotion. It's sacrifice. It's selflessness. It's meeting somebody's need. It's, it's serving and Dying for somebody. Greater has no love than this that a man feels really emotional about his friends. Is that what Jesus said? No, that he's willing to lay down his life for his friends. To get to this kind of love, the incomprehensible love of Christ, we have to go through the steps. Inner strengthening of the spirit, Christ cleaning out our house, being at home. All of this is the part of sanctification that we're in. And it's amazing in this text, when we're in this zone, not only will we be rooted and grounded in love, verse 17, but look at verse 18. We'll even be able to comprehend it. There's a whole lot of people out there who don't truly comprehend what real love is. Just look at all the broken marriages. Just in America. But you can't know real love, true love, biblical love, unless you've experienced it. And I'll close with this. Somebody asked Louis Armstrong, the great jazz trumpet player, one time. Louis, would you explain jazz? And Louis Armstrong said, man, if I got to explain it, you ain't got it. He's right. But if you've got it, Christian, you're not looking for the, comp- the explanation to comprehend it. You do comprehend it. Paul is praying for that for you right now. Again, verse 18 and 19, that you may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth. Look at this. And to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge. You can know it, Christian. You can comprehend it. But only when you experience it. My faith. Let's pray. Father, we have encouraging words today and convicting words. 
And that's what we want. Because we're not yet what we ought to be. As the old saying goes, I'm not what I used to be. I'm not what I want to be. I'm not what I'm going to be. But thank God Almighty, I'm not what I used to be. And we're looking toward that day when we won't have to struggle anymore with all this flesh and sin. But you have ordained it because you're growing us. Help us, Lord, to understand that. Help us to understand what it is you have us going through as we're being conformed to the image of Christ that we might keep a right balance of understanding all of your sovereign grace and forgiveness and yet the need for obedience in our life. We have to work at keeping that balance. Help us to do that every day as we strive to live for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.